Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, today, we're going to be looking at some interactions between the air and the ocean, air-sea interactions. Um, so uh, in the previous section, we looked at ocean motion, um, movements of the ocean caused by specifically tides. Um, you know, two, day tide, uh, two high tides, two low tides anywhere on the planet. As tides roll in, they pull material in. As the tides go out, they pull material out. Um, and of course, very special times throughout the moon's uh, orbit around the Earth. We have spring tides where your high tides are going to be really high and your low tides are going to be really low. And then neap tides where uh, the Earth, sun, and moon are at right angles. So your high tides won't be as high and your low tides won't be as low. So that was the first kind of ocean motion we looked at. And the second one was prevailing winds. So for example, at the equatorial high at about 30 degrees north latitude, you have high pressure, air sinking. Um, as we know, high pressure creates clockwise rotating winds. Those are going to affect surface currents of the ocean. So the, uh, the surface currents on the ocean primarily follow those prevailing winds. And then uh, the last one was the global ocean conveyor belt caused by, um, it's called thermohaline circulation. At the North Pole and the South Pole, um, as sea ice forms, the water becomes saltier plus the water is very cold, so it sinks. And as it sinks, it pulls in fresh water from the surface um, and pushes all of that bottom water, all of the low ocean water down south towards the equator uh, where it starts to warm up. The end result of that process, of course, is um, that nutrients, uh, minerals, carbon dioxide is brought up to the surface as that water gets warm, uh, which then, of course, applies living things like uh, phytoplankton um, and really uh, regenerates uh, those organisms and creates a, a habitable planet. So it's a very important process. But today we're gonna be looking at how specifically the hydrosphere and the atmosphere interact and uh, some ways that it can do that. So you should have already kind of seen this. Um, if you've never seen this toy before, it's really neat. Um, and of course, we'll talk about it in class. But basically, um, it is differences in pressure. Um, pressure created at the bottom pushes the material up, and so it tilts over. And then um, as the pressure gets higher up top, it then drops back down. So. Um, this is very anal analog anal analogous to what we're going to be looking at today um, because it's differences in pressure that really drive a lot of the air-sea interactions that we're going to talk about. So scales of motion. Um, there are lots of different temporal and physical scales. Um, that we could discuss in uh, air-sea interactions. And the four that we're really gonna look at, um, global winds, which are, of course, on the entire Earth scale and operate throughout geologic time. Um, monsoons, which are more seasonal, um, a rainy season and a dry season, um, and operate on entire countries. Um, El Nino, uh, which is a hemispheric interaction, um, and they're multi-year temporal scales. And then land and sea breezes, which occur along the coast, and those operate on daily uh, daily scales. This one is a big one that it impacts us here. So we're going to start with land and sea breezes. So first thing, we always talk about wind in the direction it blows from. So if we say sea breeze, we're talking about wind that blows from the ocean or the sea. Uh, if we say land breeze, we're talking about wind that blows from the land out to the ocean. So let's take a look at this animation and it'll make, hopefully, make pretty good sense for you. So land and sea breezes are really caused by differences in pressure um, on daily scales, so day and night. Right. So during the day, the land heats up faster than the ocean. You gotta remember, um, water has a high specific heat, so it can hold a lot of heat energy. Um, because it can hold a lot of heat energy during the day, the ocean is typically cooler than the land, which heats up very fast. This creates low pressure over the land, high pressure over the water. As you know, 
air always moves from high pressure to low pressure. And so during the day, we have a sea breeze. There we go. As the sun goes down, this process starts to reverse. Um, at night, the land cools off very quickly. The water, again, high specific heat, is held on to all of that heat energy that it was hitting it during the day and throughout the year. And so now the ocean is warmer than the land. This creates high pressure on land, low pressure over the ocean. Again, high to low pressure. So now we have a land breeze where the, uh, the air is actually moving from the land back to the ocean. And then when the sun rises, that process reverses again. So if you're out on a beach for 24 hours, you might notice uh, like a flag or something changing direction from daytime to nighttime. So land and sea breeze, again, differences in pressure. All right, so here is the basics again. During the day, the sun heats the land very quickly. As the land heats the air above, uh, hot air rises over the land, creating low pressure. The cool air over the ocean is high pressure, and so the winds flow from high to low. Um, that is a sea breeze, and so it flows from the ocean, high pressure, to the land, low pressure. Again, at night, process reverses. Now the land is cold, the ocean is warmer, and so we go from high pressure to low pressure, high pressure over the land, out to the ocean, land breeze. Um, this can also, of course, create thunderstorms. Um, during the day, the thunderstorms may be over land because as that cool, moist ocean water blows in, it gets heated, it rises, cools, condenses, makes uh, clouds and thunderstorms, so you may see thunderstorms right on the coast during the day or right before the end of the day. At night, those thunderstorms may move out to sea because now um, the warmer ocean air is going to rise up there, cool, condense, and make thunderstorms. You can also have this effect um, in any large water area, such as the Great Lakes. You can also have these types of effects. Monsoons. Now, monsoons operate over longer scales, um, seasonal scales. So, in and it's basically the same principle, but just on a much bigger area. Um, so, let's start with winter. In the winter, the land is going to be pretty cool as compared to the ocean. Again, high specific heat is holding that heat energy. So, we have high pressure over the land, low pressure over the water. And so, the wind is going to move from the land out to the ocean. Um, this creates very dry conditions, um, and especially in India, where you have the Himalayas bordering to the north, um, as that cold air descends down the mountains, it'll cool off even more. Um, and so uh, you really have dry air, and so a really dry season, season during the winter. In the summer, that process reverses. Now the land heats up faster than the ocean. Um, the ocean is going to be cooler. And so we have high pressure over the ocean, lower pressure on land. The air will move from the ocean into land. It's going to bring with it uh, that moist, warm, wet air, maritime tropical. Um, as it goes over the land, it, um, uh, it gets hot, it rises, it cools, condenses, comes down as rain. So in the summer, we have the rainy season. You also have... Um, Another effect that we'll talk about in just a second with the mountains, but the monsoons, of course, seasonally, so uh, are seasonal effects. So they typically last about three to four months with a transition period in between summer and winter. Another effect of the monsoon, um, if there are mountains, uh, which there are, of course, the Himalayas, um, as that air comes in from the ocean, it hits the Himalayas and it rises. This forces it to cool and condense, and of course, most of the rain is going to fall back on this side of the mountain, making um, the area on this side very wet. Um, on the other side of the mountain, we have more desert-like conditions because the rain couldn't make it over. As the air was forced up to cool, condense, it rains, and so uh, we have what's called a rain shadow effect, where you have wet side, 
where the air is rising. And then on the other side, it's going to be very dry. This is also uh, kind of an effect that happens in the um, Pacific West. So here we have the um, Cascade Mountain Range. So as the water blows in from the ocean, it rises up over the mountains, cools, condenses, the rain comes down here. It's a nice fertile valley. And then on the other side, dry rain shadow. The last one, El Nino and La Nina. El Nino and La Nina are um, operate on much larger temporal scales from about five to seven years or so. And they're really caused by the weakening of the trade winds. Um, so I've got a nice little website for you to visit. And there's a little quick video that we'll watch here. Here we go. So El Nino, La Nina, these oscillations um, in trade wind intensity influence how weather occurs here in the United States, but also across the Pacific. So um, it is a constant cycle. Um, and this one occurs on about every five to seven years. So um, a much larger cycle. All right. Um, Here's the normal uh, surface winds caused by the trade winds, of course, blowing east. So we have lots of rainfall over the, um, the Pacific Islands over here and much drier conditions over here where that high pressure is sinking. So this is normal. For El Nino though, it's weaker. So the trade winds are weaker. We have a lot of rainfall up here um, over the uh, equator. Um, it brings drought conditions um, on the other side of the Pacific, and then that pattern can reverse to La Nina and go back and forth. So again, over five to seven years. Um, real quick, I wanted to just describe these couple of words, uh, upwelling and downwelling. Upwelling is um, when deep water is forced up due to surface winds. Uh, as the wind blows over the surface of the water, and you can see the wind direction here, it pulls this deep water up, um, bringing with it, of course, nutrients. Um, there we go, and so that's upwelling. A downwelling is when the wind direction is toward the continent um, and it forces that surface water down as it's following the direction of the continental shelf. Um, so upwelling and downwelling uh, during El Nino, La Nina, and also just the trade winds and uh, other prevailing wind patterns when they hit a surface. Um, it can bring heat, distribute heat, distribute nutrients, um, and of course can also affect local climates.
All right, so that's it. Those are the three main um, ways that the air and the sea interact to influence climate. Um, just let's see, quick review. We have land and sea breezes, high and low pressure, um, reverse back and forth from day to night, monsoons, which happen on uh, seasonal scales, um, high and low pressure as it changes from the winter uh, dry conditions to the summer, very wet, rainy conditions, the rainy season. And then El Nino and La Nina. All right. So if you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Thank you so much. Take care.